All right. So, chapter 4. Uh, the woman says, the woman says to him, okay, I got it. The water's good. Give it to me so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So the woman shows interest in the water. She wants it. Why? All right, we talked about last week that Jesus told her, look, you, this drink, right, it wasn't made for you. You were made for it. It is, it is eternal life. It is salvation. It's being saved and free in me. She still thinks he's talking about literal water. And she's humiliated coming to this well week after week, day after day. It's hard work, and she's all alone. So she says, give me the water so I no longer have to come here. Not so that I may be spared from hell or my sin, simply that I may be spared by the consequences of my sin. What she was hoping for was not a bad thing. But I think it's C.S. Lewis that said that the problem with Christians, or the problem with humans, isn't that we desire too much. It's that we desire far too little. See, what she was hoping the water would bring her was such so incredibly small compared to what the water would actually bring. And that's what we'll see in verse 16. Jesus said to her, so she says, give me the water. So I will not be thirsty. I have to come here again. And Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. All right, now, that's about the most normal thing that Jesus has said this entire time. Remember, we talked about last week, it would be, it's incredibly bizarre for a rabbi to be talking to a woman, right, let alone a Samaritan Gentile woman, let alone a Samaritan Gentile woman with loose morals like the woman at the well, right? She was an adulterous woman. She didn't have a good reputation. So this is the first thing that he did that was actually like an actual rabbi to do, right? It would have made sense for him to ask her to go get her husband, because it was super unusual for a rabbi to talk to just a woman. Now, we know that Jesus' intention in asking her this wasn't that he may talk to her husband because he knew her answer. She said to him, verse 17, the woman answered, I have no husband. Now, do you guys remember the story from last week? Does she have a husband? Eh, not technically, but she's had five. And right now she's living with a man like he is her husband, but he's not. Right? That's a sin. Cohabitation, not okay with God. Right? They're having premarital sex. Right? She's in an adulterous relationship, and God is saying, no, 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 this is wrong. So technically, she's right. She doesn't have a husband, but this is what we call a lie of omission. Right? She is omitting to tell the whole truth. Therefore, she's really lying, even though what she's saying is technically true. You see it with kids all the time in Trek. Right? So you go up to a kid, and some kid comes up to you crying. He's got a red face, and he's like, ah, he's slapping. And you go up, and you say, did you slap him? He goes, no. His face is red, and he's crying, and it's got your handprint. He's like, well, I punched him, right? You lied to me. Oh, no, I said I didn't slap him. But you punched him. You knew what I meant, right? Why didn't she want to tell him the whole truth? Why? Why didn't she want to reveal the whole truth to Jesus? Well, listen, I found, I think, probably an accurate depiction of what a human, a, a woman of Samaria would have looked like at this time. Uh, and I think it explains why she wouldn't want him to know. JJ, can you throw up that picture for me? That's her. What? She's a neck and mole rat. Right? Look, John 3, 20, we read it two weeks ago. It says, for everyone who does wicked thing hates the light. She hates the light. That's why, for those of you that aren't, aren't clear on this, the reason I threw this up here is because these things hate light. Look at it. You would hate the light if you looked like that too. Right? They spend their whole lives underground, and they just that's what happens when you put a flash camera in their face. They get furious. Right? They don't have their fur on yet. So this woman, she doesn't want Jesus to see the whole picture because we are sinners and everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest their work should be exposed. So she lies to Jesus. Why? Because she doesn't want to step into the light because she looks like that in her sin. The same way that we look like that in our sin. Jesus said to her, and you're right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. I just love the emphasis that Jesus puts on, okay, clever, I got you. You're right, you don't have a husband, but you're living with a man like he is. We talked last week about what this woman may have been like. 
I had to pursue relationship after relationship. She was thirsty for something more. And she was trying to find fulfillment and marriage and relationships and the embrace of another person. And she wasn't finding it. And you can imagine as Jesus lays out all of her deepest, darkest sins in front of her, how ashamed she was hearing them come out of, her, come out of his mouth. Before she was astonished that he knew it, I'm sure she was ashamed. As she heard this man who had been so kind to her. When do you think the last time was that a, that a man was kind to this woman that didn't want to sleep with her? When was the last time that any man paid her any kind of mind that didn't want to get something back from her in return? You know that she knew just as soon as this stranger found out about her, he would stop being so kind. Right? He would never look at her again with those eyes. You know. Just by the way people speak to Jesus, he had that look that just said, I know you. Right? These eyes that looked into her eyes and said, I know you better than all of your ex-husbands combined. She knew, oh, he knows now. I'm not going to get that look again. Right, this man that would talk to her, that would drink after her, that would smile. Right, the, the purest smile. That Jesus had the purest smile that any human has ever had. Why? Because he had pure joy. Right, he had more of a reason to smile than any of us can comprehend. And fellowship with God. You know she was devastated to hear these words come out of his mouth. And then it hit her weight. How does he know these things? I mean, imagine this. Some random person. Imagine a total stranger going somewhere that you go every single day. Where do we go every single day? Where do we go to get water? In your kitchen. Imagine you walk into your kitchen and there's a stranger there leaning on your fridge, right, where you get water out of it. And he's like, sup, can I have some water? And he's like, let me tell you all of your deepest, darkest secrets. How are you going to feel? A little disarmed, right? Like, whoa, I, you don't know what to say. He said, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now, there's something beautiful that I want us to make sure that we take away from Jesus' response here. Because we, as humans, Mm, we love to hear people say things that we already know, don't we? You ever had one of those situations where you give somebody advice and they don't listen to it? And you know that it happened the way that you knew it was going to happen, but what do you do? You act like you don't know. Because you want to hear them say it, don't you? You know, you hear somebody, they come in, and you go, mm, how'd it go with that guy you were talking to that I told you was a bad idea to talk to? How'd that go? And then you hear your friend say, oh, it didn't go well. And you're like, oh, Really? Really, you don't say, how about that? I told you so. Right? We love that feeling of superiority that we get. Hearing people admit that they have fallen short. Why? Because we are evil. But what an act, think about what an act of mercy it was for Jesus to just put it out there. He didn't make her say it. He said it for her. She didn't have to go through that moment of contemplating. He didn't say, tell me about all of your sin. Or she would have to sit there and go, do I try to lie again? What do I do? What an act of mercy for God to just put it all out there, leaving nothing out. And this means, so just to be clear, it's just we're all clear about this woman and her history. She has had six men that Jesus is mentioning in serious relationships. Five she's been married to, five divorces, and now she's living with her boyfriend. So we know that this woman is a serial adulterer. The, Sumerians, uh, the Samaritans would have followed right, the Torah the, the, that said that there were very few reasons for you to be able to get divorced. So likely she was a cheater. Right? She was a sex addict. She was somebody who tried to find fulfillment in men and relationships with men. Right? It seems that she has this crippling sex addiction that has ruined her life. Right, has brought her totally down to rock bottom and torn her life apart. So Jesus brings all of that into the light. It's been in the shadows this whole time. And what happens when our sin is brought into the light? Like a mole rat. We freak out. We get terrified. And I also want to just, this is just a fun little factor, fact for you, factor. 
Jesus is also smashing the idea that living with someone is being married in God's eyes, okay? So I just want to be clear on that for you guys. Some of you guys are going to get into college, and you're going to meet people. Who are going to say, oh, no, it's fine. If we just move in together, that's basically, it's marriage. It's the same thing. We've been in a committed relationship for three years. It's cool. We can have sex. It's fine. God will bless it. That's a lie. Right? Jesus here says living with someone and, or being committed to them long term or even being engaged is not the same thing as marriage in God's eyes. It doesn't count. Right? Only a public, uh, uh, thought-out ceremony professing and promising before God to commit your lives to each other. That is the only thing that counts as marriage. So just to be clear, Jesus disproves that stupid idea. And the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. She doesn't mention her sin again. And this doesn't really blow your mind, right, that Jesus would know these things about her, because we know he's God now. And also, I think we live in an age where we find out a lot about people before we even meet them, right? Like, if somebody came up to you and told you, like, your family's name and your pet's name and, like, what music you listen to, you just, like, block them on Instagram, make your, make your thing private, because they're, oh, they've been creeping on me. Right? They've been scrolling through my stuff. They've been learning. But, so it's hard for us to imagine. Like We're used to being really, really well known in this day and age because we share a ton with each other. But it's crazy that he knew all this. So she knew this is supernatural. You could not know these things unless you were sent from God. Sometimes in counseling or just talking with you guys, when the conversation gets tough, you guys or we as people do something called deflecting. Do you guys know what that is? So sometimes when conversations get really weird and really awkward and really uncomfortable, there's a little defense mechanism where we just try and change this topic as fast as we can. All right? Some deflect with humor. It's what I do. Right? Some deflect with theological topics when the conversation gets too heavy. I've, de- I've experienced this with people I've locked eyes with tonight in here. All right? We've had a hard conversation, and I ask a question. All of a sudden you go, hey, how do you think it is that Jesus is everywhere, but he's got a physical body in heaven? Right? And you just hit a big theological question. It's like, hmm. Say, like, I'm not buying that. I'm not taking that bait. We're not talking about that right now, right? We were already on a topic. We're going to have a hard conversation. And I'm not convinced that that's what's happening here. A lot of commentators think that she's deflecting, and it seems like it. Or Jesus is like, hey, you are very sinful. And she's like, yeah, well, which, which mountain is better to kill sheep on? Just curiosity. That's what she's asking him. I don't think that's what she's doing, though. I think she's showing that she still doesn't quite get it. She goes, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You're an authority, religiously. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Remember, uh, 600 years before this, the Jews were allowed to go back under Ezra and Nehemiah from Babylonian captivity, and they rebuilt the temple. You all remember this is part of why the Samaritans hate the Jews, and the Jews hate the Samaritans. The Samaritans came along and said, we want to help you build the temple. And the Jews said, no, you can't help us build the temple. You worship God and other idols, right? That that doesn't work. We're not interested. You can't worship with us. You're not allowed in Jerusalem. You're not allowed in our temple. So they sent them away. And then they were furious, so they built their own temple, right, 31 miles away on Mount Gerizim. And remember, they rejected all the Old Testament except for the books of Moses. So she's struggling with this, this idea that Jesus has come to her. He's presented something big, and now she's asking, I think, Okay, so, so what do I do now? So I already was a little confused theologically. I know that there's all these arguments and all these debates. I know there's these big theological ideas. So she, her first step after, after hearing how, how she, her sins put to light, you've got to repent. And now she's asking, okay, so what do I do now? How about this big theological idea? And Jesus, Jesus shuts that down. And a lot of non-believers struggle with this idea. Right, before salvation, they think, okay, so like I become a Christian and then what? Right, what do I have to do? How do I have to change? What are Christian actions that I have to start doing? What do I have to stop doing? Can you make a list for me? What are the pros and cons? What's going to be terrible about being a Christian? What's going to be great about being a Christian? I know that was my case. I, was, I really struggled with becoming a believer because I didn't want to stop watching you know, R-rated movies. I thought I wouldn't be allowed to laugh at Anchorman anymore if I became a Christian. And I was like, I don't know if God's for me because of a comedy movie. Right? It's the wrong questions to ask. So he says, where do I go to worship now? So you've told me I should repent. I feel like I should repent, so where can I go? Is my mountain okay? Do I need to go to Jerusalem? And under the old covenant, God commanded his people to worship in a specific place. The Samaritans believed that. The Jews believed that. 
She's misunderstanding Jesus. She's thinking that what he wants is for her to go to the temple in Jerusalem to worship, to make an offering, to repent for her sins. And she thought Jesus was offering her a guide to salvation. He was saying, do this, then this, then this. Right? So she's trying to just clarify. So what exactly do I have to do now? Guide me. Tell me what to do to get to salvation. But Jesus isn't a guide to salvation. Jesus is salvation. Right? Jesus, show you, no, 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 you, you don't get it. He says to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. He's like, no, no, salvation isn't a place to go to or a thing to do. It is something that God does. Right? You used to worship at a place, but it, it was never about the place. You went to that place to meet a person. Right? The place was just where you met with God. It was never about the place. So she's asking him, where do I go? Basically what she's asking is, where do I meet God? Where do I go to meet God now? I've repented, where do I go? Where is God now? She doesn't even realize. Right? She looks at Jesus, she's like, okay, so do I go meet God at your temple or my temple? And God's sitting in front of her. And he's sweaty and out of breath from tracking her down. Asking for water. You worship what you do not know. Because the Samaritans worship God amongst other gods. And knowing God amongst other gods is not knowing God at all. It's the same as agnostics. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. He's saying, look, the Samaritans are wrong. And the Jews are right. But you're both missing the point. The Samaritans don't have the old... Old Testament, the Jews do, but the Jews were still missing the point. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. If you've got your Bible, underline those. Spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is seeking those people to worship him. So it's not where the true worshipers will worship the Father in Jerusalem, but it's, it's how they will worship him. How you will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The temple, yes, the temple was coming to an end. The, Herod's temple was still standing. But I mean, you guys remember, we talked about this in Ecclesiastes, because Solomon built the OG temple, and it was a big deal. It took seven years to finish. And you know how many people worked on it for those seven years? 153,000 men. Worked on the temple for seven years straight. Herod's temple, the one that would soon be destroyed, was under construction for 46 years. And it's the most sacred place for the Jews. The most sacred place on earth, right? It was, it was the new Garden of Eden. It was where heaven met earth in the temple. If you wanted to be with God, you had to go to the temple. And it was impressive. The gates were 75 feet high, huge double doors with Corinthian brass covering them, right? Absolutely mind-blowing to stand in front of the temple. You had the outer area for Gentiles where all of us would be. Right? You had the court for the women, then the Jewish men could only go so far. Then inside the temple, you had the Holy of Holies, the innermost room. And that room was the new Eden, God dwelt with mankind in that room, and you couldn't go in. Only the high priest could go in. Sinful men had to be careful. And the, and the high priest could only go in once a year with a blood sacrifice. Right? There were all these rules and regulations to approach God in worship because it was a dangerous thing. Because we serve a dangerous God. Right? I love that Chronicles of Narnia. Is that Chronicles of Narnia where they're like, Aslan, is he safe? No, he's not safe. But he's good. That's our God. He's dangerous. And if you slipped up, death. And it happened. It happens in Scripture multiple times. Because people don't obey how God has demanded he be worshipped where he be worshipped. And the whole system of sacrifice was put into place so that man could be reconciled with God. That was the purpose of the temple. That was why it all existed. But what's the problem with the system? It becomes mechanical, right? You end up getting all these priests just doing the robot over here, being like, sacrifice, here we go, read this, do that. I'm a robot, God, look at how good I am. I'm not walking more than seven steps on the Sabbath, right? 
That was what, that's what they thought salvation was. That's what they thought a relationship with God was just mechanical, just going through the motions. But when Jesus said, you've got to have a sincere heart, when he said, well, worship the Father in spirit, he didn't mean the Holy Spirit. Note that. Right? When it says worship the Father in spirit, it means the human spirit. That's what he's talking about. He says, you need sincerity. Right? The old system was broken and mechanical and it was insincere. But now, look, I've, we see it still today. We see people be ins- insincere. I've seen students be so cruel to each other. And then worship starts and they're like, oh, right? They just turn away from bullying and then just, oh, yeah, right? Y'all know people like that? It's insincerity, right? They're performing the outward actions, but the heart isn't there. But it isn't just spirit. See, the Samaritans had spirit, right? They were sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. The Jews had the truth, but they were all dead. See, you can't just have truth, and you can't just have spirit. You have to have both. The Jews were missing the spirit. The Samaritans were missing the truth, the scriptures. We see churches today like this. Right? You've got some churches that are full of spirit and they hoot and holler all over the aisle. Right? Like they got a squirrel in their pants, but they never open their Bibles. Right? They're throwing their hands up, going crazy. They got plenty of sin. They're sincerely doing something. They're trying. And what's the other end of the spectrum? Then you got the <clears throat> you got those churches. Dressing nice, self-righteous. But they're more worried about the flowers up front. They're not what's happening in people's hearts. They may read their Bible, but there's no sincerity behind it. God is spirit, verse 24 says, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Sincerity and being grounded in his word. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. I love that she lumps Jesus in with her. He'll tell us what's going on. We'll figure this out, Jesus, when the Messiah comes, right? And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And he's not in the original. Really what he said is, I who speak to you am. And remember this. She didn't see Jesus' miracles like Nicodemus did. She didn't see him do anything except for know her. And then what happens? Just then, verse 27, like a movie, just then his disciples came back. Perfect timing, right? What a coincidence. They happen to walk up right at this time. It's almost like God's sovereign, right? Here's something I think about all the time. I don't know if you guys ever think about this. Do you guys ever think about how like, what it looked like when God's sovereignty just matched up with everything that Jesus ever did. Like his timing was perfect always, you know? Like you ever see a movie where you're just like, okay, like that was a cool movie, but like what are the odds of all those exact things happening right right now? Like that was Jesus' whole life. Everything happened at the perfect moment. He was always doing things at the perfect time, right? And his timing was always perfect. His delivery was always perfect. He never failed in anything. So the disciples come walking in right at the climax of him talking to this lady, right? Everything just... Always worked, like a movie. And what did they do? They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek her? Why are you talking with her? Because they knew better at that point. They'd probably seen Jesus rebuke Peter already a few times. So they knew better than to ask Jesus what he was thinking, right? But Jews at this time, there's, there's really... Only one thing they'd be thinking is like, at best, this woman is wasting Jesus' time. Because a good rabbi would never associate with a woman. You know what? It's actually interesting. I was looking back at some ancient Hebrew text. You, know, you want to hear a prayer that rabbis used to pray? I love this. Ready? This, this is real. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who hast not made me a woman. That's a real prayer. That's what rabbis used to pray. Right? He said, God, you are so good because I'm a man. Right? Praise God, I'm not a woman. That was, that was seriously how they thought. I told you last week, they wouldn't even talk to them. There was the, there was the uh, bruised and bloody rabbis because they would literally run into things because they shut their eyes. Every time they, every time they saw a woman on the street, they shut their eyes and they trip and fall or run into something. They saw it as a sign of holiness. 
because they're ding-dongs. So the, the apostles come in, the disciples, and they're, they're speechless. They got nothing to say. You know who wasn't speechless? Look at verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Whew. What a line. Back to 28, this is interesting, or hilarious. The woman left her water jar. Right, water jars weren't like easy to come across. You couldn't pick them up at Kroger. Right, you had to make them. Jesus didn't have one, so she just left it there to run away. It's like leaving your wallet. And then she says, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Now, before we talk about what she actually said, I want to be clear that we're all noting what she didn't say. Notice that she didn't go back and say, hey, everybody, guess who's not a sinner anymore? Ha, <laughs> ha, Guess who's not, uh, guess who's righteous now, right? I'm never going to have uh, premarital sex again. I'm never going to lust again, right? I'm never going to laugh at a bad joke. I'm only going to post reformed quotes on my Instagram for the rest of my life with a landscape background, all right? I'm a good person. Look at me. Look at how I, everybody, look at I'm a new person. Forget everything you ever knew about me, right? Follow me. Do what I do. That's not Christianity. What is she saying? She's saying, look, this woman had never done a single thing to be proud of. Hours before this, she would have done anything for everyone in the town of Sakar to forget all that she ever did. She would have done anything for these people to forget her background and her history. And now it's become her testimony and she's running into the city, screaming at the top of her lungs, reminding them of who she was. She's running into the city proclaiming the very thing she was afraid of, the very reason she went to the well alone at noon at the hottest part of the day, every single day. And she came into the city screaming, he knew all the things that you guys hate me for. Could he be the Messiah? That is freedom. You want to talk about freedom from your burden, your baggage. That is the freedom that Christ offers us. What once was our shame becomes nothing. It becomes a testimony. It becomes something that God uses for good. The very things that keep you up at night, the very things that you would die, you would shrivel up and disappear if people knew about through Christ can become something that points people to him. Or think about the people that she's sharing the gospel with. The very people she's saying these things for. These are the people that are the reason she went to the well alone. A lot of them probably used her. A lot of them probably abused her. I'm sure she had a lot of relationships in there. What would they think of her? She didn't care. She knew he was Christ. And also, what a genius way. Look, she, she's a smart lady. Look at what she says. Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Notice, she knew Jesus was the Christ. But she posed it as a question. Because who was going to listen to her definitive claims about the Messiah? She invited them, just like Philip did. Come and see. They went out of the town and were coming to him. So she went and told the people. And then they went out of the town and were coming to him. So the Samaritans were coming. And it was a lot of people. Right? So, so think of this like that perfect movie, right? Like Jesus' life. So we cut to the city, everything's awesome. Then we cut back to the disciples to see what magnificent things they're discussing, right? So meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. That's funny, right? The, all of this beautiful thing's happening. And you know it was Peter, right? You know it was Peter. He's like, hey, that's a, whatever just happened, cool. I saw that lady. Are you guys, we just walked a long way to get food, Jesus. Can we eat? You hungry? <laughs> Please? Can we eat these sandwiches we just got, right? And Sakar, come on, we're, right? You can't make this up. 
They just went all the way into the town. You know, Peter was like, I'll eat his food if he doesn't want it. Because he says to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone bought him something to eat? This is hilarious. The disciples are standing here and he says, no, 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 I have something that you don't even know about. So I was like, did someone get him chips? What's Jesus got? Why is he not hungry? I don't, you know. And Jesus is making a, a deep, beautiful theological point to them. And they're just absolutely missing it. Right? What he's really saying to them is the source of my strength is not food. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Look, I love food. Surprise, surprise. Big fan of food. I think it's delicious. I like to eat it. Delicious food is nothing like the sustenance that God's mission provides. You don't need food when when you're doing work that God has given to you. It's more delicious. It lasts longer. It fills you more. But we struggle with this, right? Because we think that our food is to do the will of him who is me, not the will of him who sent me. Here we go, what's really going to fill me up is to do exactly what I want. I'm going to pursue what I want. What does that do? We talked about it last week. And all through Ecclesiastes, it just makes us hungrier. You know, look, if I gave you everything you ever wanted, if I gave you the ability to just speak and you would have whatever you spoke into existence, do you think you'd be happy? Because that's better. People spend their whole lives trying to pursue as much wealth as possible. But that's better than all the wealth in the world, right? But do you think that, like if I could give you that, do you think you'd just be good forever? You wouldn't. It doesn't matter the quantity. Nothing can fill that void. You wouldn't even get close. You could have literally every single, I could give you every single thing on earth, all of it. You could own the earth. You could own all the animals and all the food and all the people. You could literally own every, you could own the solar system. And you know what? That is infinitely smaller than what you have in Christ. God is bigger and better than every single thing that exists. Every atom and molecule and a a conglomeration of them. He's better than all of it. We'd still, with all of it, be infinitely far from God because he's infinitely bigger than all the things that you could ever imagine to make yourself happy. But the world tells you, don't repress your desires. It's what you're going to be taught. If you're, most of you are already being taught that. Right? Look, don't withhold from yourself things that you want. If you don't get what you want, you'll get depressed. You'll have anxiety. You'll become suicidal. That's the lie of the world that that anyone is suicidal because they don't give themselves the things that they want. That's a lie from hell. People are suicidal because we live in a broken and cursed world. And we can't, trying to quench that thirst with earthly things like a woman. It's like trying to fix bruises with a hammer. You just can't, you can fix things with a hammer, but it's the wrong tool. It won't work, it'll make things worse. Or we got to stop looking for an earthly solution. I'm just quoting C.S. Lewis all day today, but I think it's the screw tape letters where he said, ever-increasing craving, right? All that this does is give us an ever-increasing craving for ever-diminishing pleasures. That's all that pursuing earthly things brings us. It just gets worse the more you try, and it fulfills you less and less each time. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not say, verse 35, There are yet four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. So Jesus does a little object lesson here. They're surrounded by grain fields, and he uses them. He points them out to them. This this is probably in December, about four months to harvest time in the spring in April. Uh, So uh, he's saying, look, there are all these people. Look at these fields around us. Now, they're, they're, they're not quite ready yet, but soon they will be ripe. They'll be ready to be harvested. There are all these people all around us who are ready to join God's kingdom. Go get them. Let's get them. It's what we're here for. It's what we exist for. Already, he says, the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. Jesus is telling them it's going to be a great thing what we're doing here. It's, it's, there will be a reward. The reward will be eternal life for these people, and it will never end, and we'll all rejoice together. What's better than that? 
For here the saying holds true, verse 37, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. She's saying, I planted these seeds. Now you get to harvest them. Get ready. Get ready to work. Because they're ready to be harvested. Verse 39, and many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. Because of those words out of her mouth, many believed. And look, the woman didn't have faith in Jesus because he knew everything that she ever did. Y'all get that, right? That's not why she became a believer. It's because he knew everything she ever did and he loved her. He knew everything in her. And that look in his eyes never went away. His smile never faded. His warm presence never ceased to be warm and welcoming. Because that is the God we serve. He knows you and he loves you despite sin. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And don't lose sight of this. Every single one of these people, Jesus was seeking out just as intentionally as he was seeking out the woman at the well. Right? Jesus doesn't save the ones that he loves the most first. He just saves the ones he loves. And that's true in the room tonight too. Jesus is pursuing every one in the room individually. Now we don't know her name and we don't know their names, but you better believe he knew all of their sins. And there were people in Sakaar with worse sins than this lady because nobody knew about them. But Jesus did, and you know what? He loved them. And with that same intentionality of altering the course, right, going straight through Samaria just to, to be with this woman, to be with all of the Samaritan people that came to him, he had the same intentions with every single one and the same intentions with every person that would ever read the accounts of this all through history. And many more believed because of his word. How many? Countless. Right? They're people. And they told people. I mean, think about it. There, there are probably people in the room tonight who are believers because that line, and because somebody told somebody who told somebody who told somebody, because it never ends. There are no believers that don't make more believers. So all throughout history, like every single person in this room is a Christian because of somebody who was a Christian, because of somebody who was a Christian, because of somebody who was a Christian. All the way back to somebody that knew Jesus. All of us can trace the lineage of our faith back through history to Christ himself. We're all there. Countless people. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. And band, you can come back up. I'm wrapping up. I mean, this is our goal here right now, right? We usher people in, but Christ is the one that solidifies it. And there you have it. This is, that's the end. That's her story, a beautiful story of redemption, a woman rejected, accepted by God and loved by God, and used by God to usher in many more people. Why? Because that woman quit focusing on her sin. Did she ever sin again? Yes, she did. I prom if, if my walk and everyone that I've ever met's walk is any indication, yes, she absolutely sinned again. She stumbled, but it wasn't her identity anymore. No one looked at this woman and said, there she is. Mrs. Five divorces herself. Now, she was the woman that brought Jesus into the town of Sakar. She was the one that ushered the gospel in for every single person that lived there. That was her identity. In an instant with Jesus, her identity changed. She was rescued from her sin. And that is good news. It's a good thing, right? You guys are quiet tonight. Isn't that good? Thank you. Because guess what? The world doesn't think so. Let me tell you how the world sees this story. 
The world hears this story and they go, ha, there it is. More of men condemning women for doing what they want. I promise you, you take this, you take the story of the woman at the well into any, you take it down to Midtown in Atlanta and preach that on a sidewalk, people are going to say, oh, there it is. Listen, the, the world is going to tell you that what they did was wrong. They condemned this woman for doing what she wanted with her body. How dare they? These men, right, the world's going to tell you, ladies, the world tells you that object, the objectification of your body is empowering. They say, no, no, do whatever you want with your body, right? You, with your, objectify your sexuality. That makes you an empowered woman, right? Claim it. Make it your identity. It's, it'll, it'll make you greater. It'll make you stronger. They'll tell you that anything you do as a woman will empower you. You just got to own it. Take it back. Right? There are articles that say, young women, you should watch pornography, there's articles that literally encourage young women and say, no, too long, it's been just for the boys. You should get into it, right? It's good for you. Own it. It'll make you stronger. It'll empower you. Consume it. Don't let the boys have all that sin to themselves. That's the world that we live in today. The world says that being objectified is attractive, but it's not. She was exploited and she was rescued. The world sees this and he goes, she asked Jesus for the water and what does he do? He condemns her immediately. She says, give me the water and he brings up her sin. <sighs> Why didn't he just do what she asked? Why didn't he just give her the water? Why do you have to bring her sin into it? Because that was the first step. He was giving her the water. Right? He was, he, conviction is the fruit it's what the water produces. This thing that Jesus is offering to her, she didn't even know he was feeding it to her, but when she felt that in her heart, if anyone in this room is feeling, and you've got that feeling in your heart of conviction, like, ah, I hate the things I do, but I don't know how to stop. I have good news for you. You've got the water. That's how it starts. Our sin is made apparent. You may go, I didn't ask for it. Yeah, you wouldn't. She didn't either. But praise God. Don't ignore it. There's no point in putting it off. Step into it. Right? Step into your conviction and find the freedom that this woman found in repentance. Don't be defined by what hurts you. Be defined by who saved you. Turn from your sin. Right now in Trek, we're talking about repentance and we're teaching them. What do you turn to? Sorry, band, I brought y'all up early, I guess. I'm almost done now. What does it mean to repent? I've got the conviction. What do I do now? You've got to turn away from your sin. And look, this woman was turning away from her sin before Jesus came, but she wasn't turning to anything. She was turning back to herself. But she was putting her head into her hands. And hiding, which is exactly what the world tells us now. They say, you're canceled. You're exiled. Get out. Go stand in the corner and do this, right? And you don't get to turn around. Just go over there and feel your shame. And where do we do? We go to the corner and we put our head in our hands. Anybody been there? When you feel like there's nowhere to go? putting her face in your hands, she felt that. She had spent more time there than I want to think about. That isn't what repentance is. It isn't turning away from our sin into our own hands. It isn't hiding. Repentance is stepping out of hiding. Repentance is doing exactly what we saw in this woman, taking the freedom that Jesus offers from our sin and stepping into that freedom in Christ and, and turning to God. Right? We have got the ugliest pile of shameful garbage in our lives. It's all our lives amount to our decisions, our relationships, our mistakes. But there's good news. God didn't leave us to that. Jesus came and he gave us something new to look to. He gave us something perfect and better. He gave us a beautiful life 
that he lived, that we get to turn and focus our eyes on. So those of you that think maybe you've got a taste of the water, you feel the conviction, you don't know what to do, turn away from your sin and focus on the fact that Jesus lived perfectly for you. And all you have to do is believe that. You know what happens with that sin? It's gone. You don't have it anymore. You're free. All there is left for you is a kind and loving embrace of your Savior. So I don't know what wells you guys are going to. I don't know what your place of escape is. But no, you're not alone there. Jesus is there, waiting. Listen to him. Let's pray.